You are listening to a Geek Network interview. Be sure to hit the follow button to get notified when a new episode is available. You can also visit us at geek-network.com for your guide to the geek entertainment news you love. Created for geeks, by geeks, and remember to always geek responsibly. Hi, uh, this is Danny with uh, Geek Network, uh, bringing you another Fandom Sessions uh, interview. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're listening. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, today, I have the fantastic and talented Emmy Meyer on the show. How are you doing tonight? Thank you. It's I'm doing well. It's actually morning here, so good morning from where I am. Uh, thanks so much for the interview today. Yeah, uh, you definitely made an impact uh, quite recently off of Blue Samurai, which we'll talk about, but also want to talk about your music career overall as a whole. So, um, and I like to start things off kind of light. So I just want to go ahead and uh, ask you a nice breaker here. Um, so if you were stranded on a deserted island and only had an iPod, what five albums of your choice uh, would you have loaded on that iPod? Oh, my gosh. OK. <laughs> well, let's see. Recently, I've been re-listening to like the Miseducation of Lauren Hill. Um, I've always liked a little John Mayer. So <laughs> that might be divisive, but I would listen to one of his albums. Um, I really like kind of jazz stuff so some WC or Gershwin or I think these are piano pieces I used to play so I would have to listen to that you said five right oh yeah. you gave me three <laughs> yeah I know because you know I usually listen to artists by specific songs but I can pull out two more let me think <laughs> um you know i've been working with the uh hip-hop group the nappy roots and obviously i like some of their old school albums i've been listening to some of those like good day whatever album that song is on and then recently i was re-listening to some like andre 3000 nice um, <laughs> yeah exactly you know like some of the older like hey ya and stuff just because he released his like flute album recently yeah. right so, not so long ago. Know. That's actually like about a yeah. week ago. At least it's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little hodgepodge there to get us started. <laughs> do you, um, in particular, do you have an album that you can just listen from end to beginning without any skips or pauses or anything like that? Oh, you know, I lived in New York for a little while, and during that time, Gregory Porter, who's a jazz singer, came out with an album, and I listened to that non-stop from beginning to end because I thought it had a really good flow um let's see but any of the albums I just mentioned I could definitely listen from beginning to end nice. but it really depends like it <laughs> depends on which week I'm stranded on the island <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense and you know um uh, as someone that started off um learning classical piano uh, what was the first uh, piano song you ever learned to play? Ooh, I went through two teachers, um, one woman. So before I really got invested in piano, I was learning on upright for a really long time. And then I switched to a teacher. Her name was uh, Michiko Miyamoto in Seattle. And she taught me a lot of nice, like, I think we, I would say, at the time of an actual piece, we probably started with Bach, actually, because wow. um, by the time, I, I mean, I don't remember the pieces leading up to that. It might have been like more like exercise pieces. But one of my earliest memories is learning a simple piece of Bach because it's like deceptively simple. It seems like an easy piece, but there's a lot of different voices in it. And I remember her really telling me it doesn't have to be a fancy piece. But if you can really get inside or under the skin of a simple song like this and understand, then it'll really benefit you when you start to play more fancy songs, if that makes sense. Gotcha. So one of my earliest memories of like full songs that I learned. Yeah. Okay. And what uh, what actually made you want to transition from uh, classical piano to uh, over to the jazz scene? 
Yeah, well, actually, so I went to a small school in Seattle and um, they were, uh, <laughs> they, when I began, they had a really small uh, jazz program and they were looking for a pianist and they knew that I played classical piano and they said, well, why don't, I mean, the school is called University Prep, shout out to, I'll have to send this interview to my teachers now. <laughs> but they had a great program because it was really inclusive. It wasn't very competitive at the time. And so I think there is less this kind of focus on genre as much as, well, if you play the piano, maybe you could try being the jazz pianist in our little jazz combo. And that was really it. And I was way, like it was way over my head. So I had to quickly start taking jazz lessons at that time. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, kind of a very big step for me because I learned to improvise and listen to others and play as a group. But also I had a family friend who was a trumpet player who would always give me, it was like cassette tapes back then. But since he was a jazz trumpetist and I was a classical pianist, he was always trying to convert me. So from a young age, he was always dropping off like, <laughs> cassettes of Thelonious Monk or Miles Davis and I never listened to them until I started playing in the jazz combo and then I had to quickly listen through all of them and discover that yeah <laughs> when it comes to you know there's uh acting and uh improvise and then there's music improvise. when it comes to that um is it a little bit difficult to just come up with something on the fly when it comes to playing the piano or doing jazz or anything like that yeah, I mean, for me, um, improvising on the piano in terms of like a jazz setting is definitely very difficult. I think there are people who can do it really naturally, but because I was coming from a classical background, I really had to do kind of like the learning the different riffs and like kind of doing the hard work of uh, like transcribing like famous solos so that you kind of have that vocabulary to put into your own solos, if that makes sense. And mm -hmm. I'm totally rusty now. I could never play in a jazz combo as a jazz pianist. But but that gave me the tools to be able to compose my own music, which was really priceless. So in terms of learning to put different chord progressions together and the fact that it's okay to find your own, uh, that was like a really good lesson that jazz taught me for sure. Nice. And then with, um, you know, uh, studying in America, uh, piano, learning jazz, and then uh, going to Japan, and then, um, you know, doing music there. Um, does the does the jazz scene, or is the jazz scene different from America compared to uh, Japan? Yes, yeah, there's definitely differences. Um, I mean, there could be cultural things, too, and I also feel like these differences are really subjective on what band you see, but... I'm trying to think what the best way is to describe it. Like, even if I perform my own songs in Japan or the States, in Japan, t they tend to listen to the record and really copy it, perhaps because they don't want to, like, offend me by changing the arrangement. Mm -hmm. But whenever I play with a band in the States or something, they always kind of interpret it their own way from the get-go. And then sometimes I have to be like, oh, play a little bit more like the arrangement or it actually creates this totally different sound from the way I had envisioned the song. And so I feel like, uh, and it's a good thing. So that kind of holds sometimes. I feel like because culturally speaking, the Japanese tendency is to really uh, care for what your team members are doing or your bandmates are doing. So there's a lot of listening and actually, that's really good for jazz because you listen to what others are doing instead of just kind of doing your own thing. And then you get kind of like like a clashy sound, Yeah. obviously, um, if you were to take that to the extreme. But there's like maybe sometimes more risk taking in, in the U.S. jazz scene. But I mean, I don't know. I would hesitate to make big judgments like that because it's always changing. I'm always meeting new jazz musicians who are like, wow, this is universal. This could be done anywhere. So yeah, I don't know. That was my, that was like my student thesis when I started abroad in Japan, <laughs> but I'm always being proven wrong in every single way. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, speaking that makes of thesis, is, uh, you did do another one beforehand, right? If I'm not mistaken. Oh, wait, sorry, what was that? Oh, I said, uh, speaking of thesis, uh, you did one before going to Japan, didn't you? I did. Uh, when you were did in New I? York. <laughs> what was it? Uh, when you were in New York, I believe you did an another thesis. I might have. I don't remember that, but that doesn't mean I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> It's all just right, something was... I read online, so sorry. <laughs> oh, no, it's all good. I think I only did one. Okay. Um, so when I was studying abroad in Japan, I was actually studying, like, the mix because I was in Kyoto, and Kyoto has, like, five different colleges, so it was a great place to study bands, really student bands. There are students there who are really, um, like, using tradition, like, talk about Amy Daugherty's soundtrack, right? They're... Um, students who are learning shamisen and koto and then playing that in like a rock setting and stuff or a jazz setting so that's kind of what I was studying when I was there and also sort of the j-pop scene a little bit but honestly it's so in the past that <laughs> I wouldn't even be able to tell you what my thesis that's is okay. really about <laughs> <That's> okay <laughs> don't tell anybody because it's so embarrassing but like isn't that funny how yeah, like you spend so much time in school learning the academic things, and then sometimes you go into the real world and you're like, oh, the real world is very different. <laughs> uh, crap, what's going on? What did I forget? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, no. A lot of uh, of your fans uh, may not know this, but uh, what struggles did you have to overcome uh, when it came to uh, self producing your uh, debut album? Yeah, well, okay, so my debut album, Curious Creature, I could not have done without the help of my best friend at that time in college. Her name was Melissa, and she kind of heard me play one of my songs, um, and it was before I was really confident enough to sing or do singer-songwriting in front of other people, and she said, and I actually told her, I was like, this is a song that my friend wrote, and then after listening to it, she was like, I, I think you wrote that. And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I was too shy to even say, like, it was my own song. And she essentially was really right in saying, like, if you're going to create music, it's fine to make it just for yourself and for your, you know, tight circle of friends. And that's really what still drives me a lot. But if you're if you're creating something, why not share it? Why be afraid to share it? And so she really taught me little ropes um and I actually did an EP with her called Magnolias in LA and then my first debut album Curious Creature I recorded in Seattle and um it's funny it was hard in terms of like funding it myself and then all the musicians were really kind enough to work on a shoestring budget but it was not hard in the sense that there were very little like preconceptions of what I was trying to do I wasn't I didn't know anything about the music industry there's I had no idea about like what's catchy or what does it mean to think of a demographic or anything like that so I mean in some ways it was one of the easiest because it's before you learn all that stuff that you can't unlearn if that makes sense you know, so in terms of song structure, oh, you should always have a hook, stuff like that. I didn't really care about, I didn't know about. So that perhaps, I don't know if it answers your question. It was hard in terms of making sure you organize and get all the right musicians and get the right, you know, sheet music, stuff like that. It's still hard for me too, <laughs> but it was the easiest in terms of very little of what I thought on like the receiving side of what it's like to hear a song from the audience's perspective that wasn't on my mind at all yeah and then so you do a couple of tours here and there uh with uh with your debut album um you know did you do any sort of touring or did you just keep it to yourself and you know the yeah. record was out and that was it yeah well it's always been kind of for me just a like <laughs> A slow simmer so um you know after my debut album then I started going back and forth between Japan and the U.S. a lot and that was a fun period and then through that I toured you know Japan did like 
Fuji Rock, did some festivals. And then I also, um, through some of my subsequent albums that got re-released, for example, like Galaxy Skirt, that was released in Korea. So I went on a tour of Korea and that was really, really fun. So things like that, I've performed in Hong Kong and China. Um, got to actually play a little bit in Brazil. So, you know, here and there, it's never been like a big production, but people tend to find me, invite me to things. And I really enjoy that and appreciate that. Yeah. Well, um, with uh, this being the film festival, how did you manage to actually uh play at the uh, LA Film Festival when you know you were a jazz performing artist oh um is this which is this are you um the LA Film Festival <laughs> yeah that, that was listed online as well so um am I playing piano with a rapper for that or not oh that... that I can't remember I just uh that's something that I did write down but I can't remember that part all right Again, I'm not going to tell you that you're not right. So, <laughs> so we can skip it. Well, I performed at the Sundance Film Festival. Okay, in, that's um, probably the one I meant. Sorry. Yeah. Also, I mean, I'm not, again, I'm not going to tell you you're wrong because you might be right. <laughs> like, my memory's so bad. But um, at the Sundance Film Festival, I performed for, uh, yeah, one of their lounges, which was really, really cool. That was like, I got to meet a lot of great composers, film directors. Um, at the time, I was actually too young to be performing at the venue I was at because they were serving alcohol. So somehow we figured out a way. <laughs> I could like, in. <laughs> come in the back seat, you know, and then like not mingle where they were serving alcohol. But yeah, I don't know. I've always had a fascination for the intersection of film or visual media with sound. So, you know, it was like one of the best experiences I could have as a, as a, you know, like a freshman in college. It was super fun. Yeah. Nice. And, you know, let's uh, just clear the elephant in the room. Uh, how did Netflix uh, get in touch with you for uh, Blue Samurai? And how did uh, the amazing For Whom the Bell Tolls by Metallica come to life? Yeah, so I know it's so crazy, right? Because I wish you could tell me how they found me. <laughs> I still don't <laughs> know. Isn't that funny? I'm sorry, I'm just like plugging the computer because it's good in it. Um, I just woke up one morning and it was like, my partner was like, look, there's a, because I'm really bad at checking my email. I really mm -hmm. struggle with social media. If you haven't noticed, <laughs> I'm like, I live in the dark ages. So I was just like kind of in bed and you know because of the time difference and I went, it came in this like look this is like an email and it's like the type of thing you've always wanted to do you might want to check this and it was from uh, Netflix Music Lab um, and Netflix Music Lab I guess is working on the music side of things and essentially the nitty-gritty of it is they had like a like an item like look this is we are looking for someone to do, make the Japanese lyrics and sing the song for whom the bell tolls and I'm not sure how many people they had sent it to but I could see on the works it wasn't like a singled out for me so I assumed a lot of people were probably working on this right now and pitching their version. So it was really like a dream come true for me because then I could use my Japanese skills to make the Japanese lyrics. And furthermore, instead of being pigeonholed into like a jazz singer songwriter stuff, it was almost like, have you heard <laughs> the other yeah. stuff I do? Because I'm really glad that that didn't prevent you from sending me this memo yeah so yeah I mean because that's the biggest hurdle right when people listen to your back catalog and then assume that oh she's not right for this and so to me it was like an absolute honor so quickly I just went into the studio my local studio in Tokyo with my you know engineers that I trust and we whipped up a demo for it and 
uh, obviously before that I had to kind of translate the lyrics and figure out what would be best because the if you just straight translate the lyrics from like for example <laughs> I brought the lyrics because of my bad memory but like make his fight on the hill in the early day a straight up translation is not quite as poetic and it doesn't have quite the same effect in Japanese but knowingly also this has to be approved by the publishers I wasn't going to rewrite it so it was it was finding that fine line mm -hmm. of like what is the feeling and the emotion behind like that early day fight on a hill you know and like having had to climb that hill presumably what how do you get that kind of you know overall the songs like struggle rage like um like not giving up even though it's like such a ruthless thing you know all of that uh was really really fun to try to find a way to um work into Japanese while also matching the syllables if that makes mm -hmm. sense uh and even for example like the beginning make his fight on the hill is uh if you copy the melody it's okao it's like on the hill i mean i'm not sure if i'm making sense but in japanese it would make more sense to sing okao which uh flows better to the japanese ear so knowing that i presented two options like the version that really matches the metallica melody and the other version that would make more sense for the japanese listeners so i don't know it, all of that was like a really good learning experience for me and um i sent it in and then it was a really short deadline but they asked for uh to hire keys to get like a more energetic vocal delivery and this is an interesting thing. Like in the past, I've actually done a few things like this with streaming companies, I guess, um, where they're looking for a Japanese vocal, but they want it. It starts getting to this like really comical thing where they start wanting it in a higher and higher key. And I think that's because they're looking for like a more Japanese anime female voice that yeah. a lot of companies are used to. And that's at that point, I start thinking, okay, I'm not the singer that you are looking for because there's so many good singers who can do a higher, more, um, you know, the thing that you perhaps m many people expect of, of an anime song sometimes, depending on who's creating it. So when they started asking me for that, I was like, oh, no, maybe this is, again, it's not going to be the right fit because they're they're not going to want my, like, huskier voice. They're looking for a more standard, like, uh, higher pitch feminine sound. So anyways, I sent the higher keys and I was like, that was a really fun experience, but I'd be really sad if the world never got to hear this Japanese version of <laughs> Metallica. Um but they used it and I was really, really grateful because uh, I also felt like it was a really, really brave choice to use my voice and then a cover of Metallica. And overall, I can't be more grateful yet. I don't so, know if that was a long answer. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. The more information you know, I get, like, that's better. I like hearing, you know, everything, every little detail. So that's. You can great. edit it out, right? You can make it make sense. Yes, I can <laughs> show you that. Don't worry. Okay, thank you. Make me sm sound like I'm smart. That's all. <laughs> <I want. laughs> um, yeah, just anyways. So, uh, coming from uh, your classical piano and your jazz sound, do you yeah. uh, do you feel like uh, covering the song, you know, kind of like pushed uh, pushed you a little bit more than like the sound that you're usually you, that you're used to coming from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm glad you asked that question because um, it might feel like it's like, a, you know, something you have to strain to do if you're usually doing like more jazz or classical hip hop. But also, like, I've done a lot of uh, like songs for commercials, if that makes sense. I even like did Prius? one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Prius. Like, they all air in Japan. So hopefully, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's, well, 
I guess my point is like, I'm very used to people being like, you know, sing that one more time, but like Beyonce, like things that come out of way left field. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know like who you're talking to? It's like, I'm not Beyonce. It doesn't make sense. (laughs) It's kind of like that movie Lost in Translation where sometimes like, you know, anyways, I guess I'm used to challenging myself as a singer. And in that sense, when I'm in the studio, especially if it's for a song that I haven't written, it's like in some ways freeing to not have to adhere to a certain sound. And in this case too, like just having done the lyrics in Japanese, it gave me a long time to think about like what the main character of the song would be doing. Mm -hmm. And then when I learned about the synopsis of like, you know, Mizu being half Japanese, half Caucasian, and maybe sometimes the isolation or sometimes the chameleonic qualities that come with that, different things of that really resonated. So it was emotionally super easy to get into the state of mind of singing this song, definitely. And in terms of like the delivery, it was just more kind of a fun chance to, you know, kind of separate myself from any other stuff that I've done and give it my best shot. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, it was liberating if anything. Nice. Uh, the other thing is, uh, so your second album, Passport, uh, was written entirely in Japanese uh, where you teamed up with uh, Shingo. What was that process yeah. like? Well, I learned so much from him because he's he'd grown up thinking a lot about language, obviously, as a rapper and Japanese and English. So it was essentially kind of like after my first album and then also being in Japan and going back and forth between the states, I had the option of kind of going like a maybe a more major label route where perhaps I would start singing like you know Japanese songs with the English hook or things like that like there's really nothing wrong with that and I actually find that really catchy but our challenge was rather why don't we not do that and go like the the subversive route or like a very different artsy route of making sure we don't kind of incorporate any English and just making a really Japanese lyrical album so it was really fun uh recorded bits of it in San Francisco bits of it in Japan, some overdubs in Brazil. And I I think that it was, again, almost like my debut album. I had no preconceptions of what it was like to sing in Japanese yet. So in that sense, probably my flow and the my delivery is probably really uh, unique and in a way that if I tried to replicate it now, I couldn't because I know too much now about what it's like to sing in Japanese. So yeah, yeah like a little time capsule. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then on Wednesday, uh, Golden Child drops. Um, so the song is going to drop on um, majority of the music streaming service, uh, yeah. streaming services. And also yeah. um, the video will drop uh, on YouTube. What can we yeah. expect from the song? Yeah, so this song actually, I, you know, I love writing songs for my friends. Um, whenever I have writer's block, I just, I'm like, hey, do you want a song to sing? And then it's actually really easy for me to think of a person and whatever they're going through life right now and then write a song for them. So I originally wrote this for my friend. Her name is Sumire. And, you know, she's an actress and a singer and a very talented individual. She grew up in Hawaii and Japan. And uh, for me, at the time, I wanted to write a song. She had just become a mother, and she was telling me about all these inspirations about how she likes, like, the Hawaiian guitar sound. And I wrote this song for her, and we took it to her label, and they were, (laughs) I don't know how much of this I should say, but they were just, like, it was a major label thing. It was, like, this is not... uh, just to summarize, it was not poppy or trendy enough. So I was like, well, then I'll record it. <laughs> and I'll feature you as my guest. <laughs> so oh, nice. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, whatever, whatever serves the music, you know, I don't, I just never like the idea of something stifling a creative process. So 
uh, on Wednesday, my English version is coming out. But what I'm really excited about is the version the next Wednesday, November 29th, which is my Japanese version featuring her. Um, and it's kind of a lullaby, it's sort of talking about like how, you know, we're similar or different from our parents. Um, and it's supposed to be a comforting song. So it's very different from like, for example, the Blue Eyes Samurai uh, track, but it was more kind of just like a celebration of my friendship with her and uh, creating, yeah, an English and Japanese version and the differences there. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Can't wait. Um, yeah, so that's a few days uh, from this interview where the song is coming out in English. And then next week, it'll be in Japanese. Again, looking forward to it. Can't wait. Thank you. Yeah, we filmed the music video in Tokyo, so you'll be see little bits of a park and the studios here. So hopefully that's kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is one song you wrote that emotionally broke you down and why? If you can think of any. Mm. Let's see. Probably have a few. I tend to take like really hard moments and try to hide them inside positive nuggets. So it's kind of funny when people are like, you write so many happy songs. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, yeah, no. <laughs> it's the lyrics, they're not that heavy. But um, I don't know, my album Suitcase of Stones was like kind of a heavy album for me. And it probably doesn't sound that way uh from the outside but it was mainly I wrote it the year I was studying abroad in Japan I was like kind of homesick it was my first time being on my own in Japan so without like the cocoon of family or friends so in a lot of ways it was a good time of like self-discovery but I was in the I mean you know in college, you have the time to really kind of like think about yourself and your identity. But yeah, uh, there are songs in there that when I was feeling a little bit like, oh, I don't know if I fit into either culture, that kind of stuff, I probably put into that. And that was sort of my form of therapy to be able to put it into a song and then kind of like move on. Because mm -hmm. if it's not, it's going to just stew inside and any heartbreak or sorrow or you know things like that that you're feeling if I, I didn't want to just keep it inside so in that sense it's probably a big reason why I started writing songs so that I can just kind of like put it out it's and then it's move let's move on to the next <laughs> type thing if that makes sense yeah when you and so when you write or compose all that that style of music you feel uh some sort of emotional release Definitely. Yeah, I really do. And, you know, in general, I probably am a person that runs a little on the blue side, if that makes sense. My friend and I are always talking about how we like just a hint of blue is like our standard <laughs> location. But um, I think by having a release like that, it really allows me to kind of process my feelings in a good way and I'm sure it, and it's the same with listening to music I listen to things and then I feel better too but yeah. you know honestly the Metallica song probably let me release a lot of like pent-up rage <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I mean I can't I was even saying like I think to Amber you know who created this show I was like I didn't know how much rage I could have until I was able to like kind of cathartically like use it for singing this song because I really do like relate to you know and I think we all have that whether it's like different parts of our identity or where we live or how we grew up but certain places where you're like just not accepted even if you want to be accepted and then you start like being really like ashamed or angry about that part of yourself and what do you do with that do you like keep it like repressed or you know <laughs> or like you know through music or but in this case yeah I was able to tap into that for this song and I maybe that's why so many people you know 
relate to Metallica and I was watching old clips of them too it's just like something like very visceral when you hear like you know the track and the delivery of his voice all of that I really loved getting into yeah yeah and it's it's honestly an amazing cover and yeah so that makes me so happy I'm really like I've got to be honest I'm I'm often very isolated from like the U.S. scene or like on a bigger I'm very like in Japan you know and it's an island and a lot of people come visit here right now it's a really popular spot and so I get to meet a lot of people but to hear like all the feedback for this anime itself Blue Eyes Summer and the beautiful you know, art direction, the beautiful fight scenes, the colors, all of that. And to be a part of that and then to also have the response for a song is like so surreal. I, yeah, it like makes me feel like part of the family, like a very big family and it makes me really happy. <laughs> well, let's hope, uh, you know, Metallica invites you out to one of their shows, you know, when they start touring <laughs> again since they just wrapped up their tour, so. I know, it's so you funny, like my... It's cool. My agent in Japan used to um, rep Metallica for Japan. So he especially oh, wow. was like really excited about that. And he was telling me how one of them had like an anime, you know, like a tattoo mm -hmm. too. And um, he even went to Russia to watch their performance once. And he was saying it was so crowded that he had to walk home to his hotel and stuff. And like hearing all these stories about him, uh, you know, on the Metallica tour and then getting to sing this was just like yeah again kind of surreal and I love it I love that this like their song is getting a Japanese version and it's like kind of a rebirth of it but you know the essence of it doesn't change I mean yeah I love it maybe I should add that album to my deserted album <laughs> <laughs> deserted island album list <laughs> So For it's sure. an amazing opportunity that you had. Uh, now, yeah. uh, with this song being um, Blue Samurai, uh, do you see yourself writing or composing uh, for more TV or uh, movies in the near future? Yeah, I mean, that's always the goal. Honestly, I've always like uh, wanted to do stuff like that. So that's, again, not to always bring it back to this, I was so grateful for this opportunity uh, especially because it wasn't something that they would have been like, who does this sound? Let's find her. So yeah. if there's a, another person who's willing to take a risk like that and try something with me in that sense, I would love to. Um, otherwise, yeah, I I did do like some composing for a recent film called Dealing with Dad. It's about a Taiwanese American family. Um, I think it's on streaming. But that's more singer songwriter score and um i did a few pop songs for another film called the modelizer which was filmed in hong kong but i would love to do more scoring if the opportunity arises and maybe if it's like a collaborative process too that would be totally up my alley awesome and um so yeah um you know kind of mentioned touring in the past uh but do you have any uh future tours or anything coming up where we can see you Oh, well, sometimes I get to perform in Seattle and New York, and I love that. Um, right now, for the foreseeable future, I am in Japan. So if you visit, if anybody listening visits Japan, please make sure to check out my Insta or Twitter. I've been doing, like, the Blue Note um, places uh, and a few hall shows. But, yeah, I always have more shows in Japan, and I know I have one coming up in Kyoto next year, too. But looking for more ways to get closer to the u.s audience and or anywhere really i'll keep you posted <laughs> okay sounds good um yeah. and actually uh just have a few more questions here but um yeah. if you could give your younger self any piece of advice knowing the knowledge you have now what would that advice be oh yeah hmm well, one thing I'm definitely working on is like not getting in the way of your own happiness, which by which I'm trying to say is like, just don't worry about things so much. Um, 
just let yourself enjoy the moment and embrace it, whatever is happening, because everything is so short. Everything goes by so quickly. But the other thing is really uh, in terms of more like work stuff. I know I was always like rushing, like trying to. I don't know why I always rushed myself, but I, that's why I've released so many albums. Something about me was like, I only have a limited amount of time to make music but it's really not true <laughs> you keep making it and also I think opportunities do come when you're ready for them so like case in point the Metallica song I mean if I hadn't spent so much Japan time I might not know how to translate the lyrics you know as smoothly as, or if I hadn't already done a few projects like this where it turned out my voice wasn't the right fit, then I wouldn't know what it's like to go in the studio and just kind of be um, objective about it and separate your own identity or self from what, you know, what's required of the vocals. So yeah, I think that there are really no shortcuts and no need to stress about it because opportunities will find you when you're ready, I suppose. If that makes sense. No, that's solid. That's solid advice. Okay. Um, okay. Also, uh, where can we find you on? I know you mentioned earlier you're not that great at social media, but oh, yeah. we find you on social media. Uh, yeah, I'm at Emmy Meyer, so E M I M E Y E R, Instagram and Twitter and Facebook pages. Um, I know I'm so bad at it, so I'm trying to get better at it. <laughs> <laughs> like honestly I I should post more and recently like just yeah with the great feedback on the Metallica song and the trailer I couldn't help myself I got so excited I was like chatting with people I was like yeah this is so cool but um yeah I try, I'll try to keep that up, but that's where you can always find me I always appreciate messages as long as I see them <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah, I'd love to connect if if anybody listening would like to. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it was a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your morning to talk to us evening here. But again, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. I had a lot of fun on this interview. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you reaching out to me. And I love the Arizona connection, Arizona, Tokyo. And uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks again. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Alright, bye. <laughs>